Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another round of Tuesday Night Legacy. It's been a little while since we've done one of these, but I thought with all of the interest in the format, we would do another round of Judge's Tower. Let's get into it. So like I said before, this is a specialty format similar to something like Dan Dan, where you have a special set of rules. You're still playing a game of magic with your friends, but in this case, you are going to have infinite life and infinite mana. And the way you lose this game is by breaking a rule. There are several rules to this game. I think the most important one though is that all maze on cards are musts. You must take every action that you can as soon as you possibly can. And if there is a point in which a card had an ability or or a cast trigger that you could have cast it or activated that ability when you had priority and you pass that priority, then you lose. The cards that you see here to my right <laughs> are the cards that were used uh, this round for the tower. Uh, going into each and every one of them is going to be pointless since we'll talk about it in the video coming up. The last time we did this, we did it in a suite of four players. This time we decided to do a 1v1 duel, so let's get into it. Today's video is sponsored in part by Collector Legion. Check out CollectorLegion.com for all your MTG needs and more. On the right, you have myself playing this game that I love so very much. And on the left, we have Jonathan, a legacy player who was so bold as to play this game on camera, not knowing what it was when he walked into the store that night. Let's go ahead and see how this goes. Jonathan starts on the play here. You see he has a Chainer's Edict in hand. So Chainer's Edict targeting a player. There doesn't need to be a creature in play, so you can cast the spell. He targeted himself and the other card he could not cast. We see a Whispering Madness at the table. This is basically going to wheel all the cards in hand and everybody draws cards equal to the largest number discarded. Since I'm the active player, I stopped Jonathan from drawing that card as the top card is for me to draw. And we see a Jeru and Hazaret hit the field. So this card has Vigilance and Haste as long as you have one or fewer cards in hand. On Declare Attacks, you reveal the top six cards. I think you exile them. And if there is a legendary creature among them, you may play that card until end of turn. Does have normal timing rules though, so you're not casting creatures during the attack step. So this Melek is it Paragon is exiled until end of turn. The damage is dealt with Jeru. In second main phase, Melek is it Paragon hits the field, revealing the top card of the library, making it so that is it, uh, instants and sorceries can be cast off the top of the library, still obeying uh, normal mechanic rules. Can't cast sorceries at any time. You can't cast sorceries. We see a Magma Phoenix and a Mirror Retriever hit the field. Not having any enter the battlefield effects, these will come into effect later. We see Genesis Chamber come onto the field. So anytime a creature is cast and put onto the battlefield, not cast, just put onto the battlefield, its controller gets a 1-1 colorless mirror. This is uh, for me to keep track of since I am the owner of this artifact. We see a whiff on Jeru and Hazaret, no legendary creatures and an all out attack. You must attack with all creatures as Fable and you must block with all creatures as Fable. So we see that Magma Phoenix die so when Magma Phoenix dies, it deals three damage to each creature uh, and each player on the battlefield. With that creature in the graveyard and that trigger on the stack, you can return Magma Phoenix from your graveyard to your hand for five mana, which is what happened. Kills the creatures, the Magma Phoenix returns. Mirror Retriever does not have a target, as when it dies, another target artifact is returned from your graveyard to your hand. Jonathan checking to see if Melek had the priority to cast the card on top of the library. And I do not believe he did. So we have a Magma Phoenix in play, second main phase, dropping Magma Phoenix in play, getting a 1-1 one, one mirror. And passing turn. We have those fun little draw your own token cards, since there are so many different types of tokens in this format. We see Mirror Retriever come into play with an Unburial Rites. So that trigger is going to happen. Uh, Jonathan has to wait until the Mirror enters the battlefield and he casts Unburial Rites again from the graveyard since it does have flashback. And it is his turn, so he is the active player in charge of the graveyard, having to do anything that uh, you would cast something out of your grave. Malak, is it Paragon? Being the choice for Jonathan, going bold. We see a Mu Yan Ling. 
off the top of the library. So how planeswalkers work, you must uh, activate them from bottom to top. So Mu drawing three card or drawing two cards with a minus three activation. Since they were both drawn at the same time, this Noxious Revival that is drawn is not able to be cast with Malak Is It Paragon. It wasn't like draw one card, then draw another card. It was draw two cards. And since they both have instant speed, basically uh, you know, the Notion Thief has flash. So flashing in Notion Thief, holding priority, casting Noxious Revival to put Oust on top of the library. Any card is put into the onto the top of the library. We see another mirror come into play. And Oust is a sorcery speed spell. So we're seeing attacks with the two creatures that can attack. The 1-1 one, one mirror and the Magma Phoenix. And we see Jonathan declare blocks with just mirror retriever. He did have two other mirror retrievers to block with. And Melek could have also blocked the mirror. So that is going to be the end of the game. Jonathan, or I am up one point. And we are on to game two. Now you can play this game as long as you want. The points don't really matter. It's just if you decide to play through the entire library, you can count up how many points and, uh, you know, somebody wins. But really, we just continue to play until uh, we don't want to play anymore. So we see a Wormfang Behemoth try to come into play. If this would have resolved, that would have tucked uh, Jonathan's hand underneath, basically exiled under the Wormfang Behemoth. We saw an Arcane Denial and then a couple questions about it on who draws what. But basically the Wormfang Behemoth was countered. And on next upkeep, I need to remember that Jonathan draws two cards and I draw one card. We're trying to see like who draws two cards or who draws one cards. Uh, but the, the way that it's split, you basically can choose. And so we see Fermir, Prince of Ithilien, come into play. This has a end step trigger on the end of your opponent's turns. Very difficult to remember. Uh, we saw Jace Architect of Thought for a hot second there, but instead of activating this Planeswalker, used another sorcery speed card, which was Salt Blast to destroy target non-white permanent. When I passed turn, Jonathan did draw his extra card for the Prince of Ithilien, Faramir, Prince of Athelion, uh, because I didn't declare attacks, then you get to draw a card. So Jonathan is now in his turn, playing the Garrick Cursed Huntsman, destroying target creature, and drawing a card. Since none of these things have instant speed effect, you can play sorceries uh, in any order that you'd like. So Jonathan trying to decide like what is going to be the best way for me to drop all these cards into play. Is it worth it to just drop them all, or is there a way that I can cast less cards? Jonathan decides to go for a Fasting. Fasting is going to stop him from drawing in his draw step for like five turns. Yeah, when Fasting has five counters on it, destroy it. Then uses his Grave Digger, which is going to return a Summon Creature from Discard Pile to hand. Uh, which is going to be Wormfang Behemoth, and uh, that gets the rest of the rid of Jonathan's hand, and he passes turn. We see a Phyrexian Vault come into play. This is basically sacrifice a creature, draw a card. Jonathan not having to draw any cards because fasting. Putting one hunger counter on there, drawing a couple, uh, or gaining a few life. We see Garrick get activated on zero, which is going to put two black black, or two, 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 Black and green wolves into play. When they die, uh, Garricks, all Garricks you control, get a counter. And then swing out with the Gravedigger and the Wormfang Behemoth. Master of the Feast will enter the battlefield, and as soon as it is in play, it will be sacrificed to the Phyrexian Vault. We see Heliod the Radiant Dawn enter. With that, a uh, trigger goes on the stack, return target enchantment card that isn't a god from your graveyard to hand which will be the Master of the Feast, casting Master of the Feast, and then transforming Heliod. Activate only as a sorcery. Heliod turning into Heliod the Warped Eclipse. They cast spells as though they have flash, and they cost one less. That one doesn't matter, but being able to cast all spells uh, as an instant makes this game a lot harder. 
So we see Jonathan on tap with his two wolves, Gravedigger and Wormfang Behemoth. Doesn't have to draw a card because of fasting, but he will have to activate this Garrick again because it, it hasn't gained any counters. So the only thing he can do with Garrick is make, make wolves. So we see a lot of wolves attacking. Two wolves, Gravedigger, and the Wormfang Behemoth. Making wanna making I want to make sure that Jonathan keeps playing this game as complicated as possible, so offering the Master of the Feast to trade with the Wormfang Behemoth, and Heliod will block his Gravedigger, forcing him to draw the two cards that were exiled under Wormfang Behemoth. So basically they go from exile back to play. Four damage dealt from the dogs, but not a huge deal. All legal blockers were declared. And I believe he has a, uh, what is that, Deceiver of Form in hand, which he slaps down here, and then decides to Grave Betrayal it immediately. Grave, or Grave Exchange, excuse me, it's a different card. So return target creature card from your graveyard to hand, and then target player sacrifices a creature. He chooses himself to get rid of the Deceiver of Form and returns the Master of Feast to his hand and then casts it. We see that there are four dogs on the battlefield. During upkeep, sacrificing Heliod to the Phyrexian Vault. Main phase playing Mass Hysteria. This is going to give all creatures haste. And then playing a Time Warp, which is going to make target player take an extra turn after this one, choosing Jonathan. Master of the Feast will force me to draw a card, as that is what that card actually does. Beginning of your upkeep, each opponent draws a card. Passing the ability to draw a card off of Hunger, or uh, Fasting. <laughs> and we see attacks for nine. Oh, but Jonathan realizes at the last second that Mass Hysteria gives all creatures haste. So attacking with the two dogs that were just created. So six, six woofers <laughs> coming at you. No blocks can be declared on my side since I have no creatures. And Jonathan goes to his actual turn. That was uh, because of Time Warp. Time Warp was the last turn, and now this is his real turn. A Strangling Soot. It's going to kill a woofer, destroying target creature with toughness three or less. And now that it is in the yard, it is Jonathan's responsibility as active player to cast the flashback. Basically, while that trigger, Garrick trigger, is on the stack, uh, he uses the other one. So two triggers go on Garrick. Or two, two loyalty counters, excuse me. Put a loyalty counter on each Garrick you control. Fasting up to four counters. Now, see, fasting would be sacrificed if Jonathan was forced to draw a card at any time besides his draw step. But he hasn't had to do that yet. So we're seeing Garrick destroy one of the wolves. Destroy target creature, trigger goes on the stack. Destroy target creature, draw a card, trigger goes on the stack, trigger goes on the stack. So we see the counter on Garrick and the fasting destroyed. And he draws a scramble verse. So how scramble verse works is we're going to take every permanent in play and uh, randomly decide who gets them. I believe that Jonathan chose prime numbers and I chose non-prime numbers, or it's the other way around. Yeah, Jonathan got non-prime numbers. And so we're just going through, deciding on these dogs. I think this is the third dog. So I have two dogs, now Mass Hysteria and Phyrexian Vault. And now that that's resolved, everything comes into play untapped. Going to activate, <laughs> get another counter on Garrick and draw a card. We see Surak and Goreclaw. This is a pretty fun one. It's got Trample, other creatures you control have hand Trample. Whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on it and gains haste until end of turn. The haste part doesn't really matter since uh, we already have haste on Mass Hysteria. We see a double block here. 
getting to deal six damage. He's trying to decide if it's better to kill both wolves or kill the Master of the Feast. So five damage to Master of the Feast, one damage to one wolf. And we pass turn. Trying to decide if there's anything I need to do in the graveyard during upkeep. We see a Phyrexian Gargantua enter the battlefield. This is a 4-4 when it enters the battlefield. You get to draw two cards and lose two life. So it's like you take two Phyrexian Ragers and just shove them together. And they actually cost just as much if that happened. A Howling Mine and a Golden Tail. I believe that's what Sensei Golden Tail enters the battlefield. This is going to have an activation effect. Put a training counter on target creature. That creature gains Bushido 1 and becomes a Samurai in addition to its other types. Play this ability only any time you can play a Sorcery. Making the Phyrexian Gargantua a, a Samurai a samurai Phyrexian Horror. And we see that horrible card come into play. Prophet of Crewfix, which is going to untap all lands and creatures you control during each player's untap step. And also make it so creatures you control, our creature cards, have flash. So big attacks, trying to decide, ah, kill this Garrick. Hit you for this much. And we're going to go to turn. Jonathan untaps. All things untap. Jonathan goes through upkeep and tries to go to draw step. Howling Mine activating on draw step. I try to activate Sensei Golden Tail. As I see it as an activated ability. And I was reminded by the players watching that that is only at sorcery speed. So I lose that game. And we decided to only do two. So that is the end of that. So kind of a shorter one there, only two rounds. If you want to see us do more of that in the future, please let us know in the comments and uh, give this video a like. And if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps us out. Thanks as always to Spellhold Games and Collector Legion for allowing us to record in their play space. We really appreciate it and wouldn't exist without you. If you want to see the, uh, the, the deck, what's the best word for it? the entirety of the Judge's Tower deck list that we play with. I will include that in the comments down below. And if you want to see a more detailed ruling of what Judge's Tower actually entails, it is all included in that link to the Judge's Tower. So go check it out. That's going to do it for us this time. As always, I am Eugene, and this is Tuesday Night Legacy. We'll see you next time.